Kieran O'Connor and I lecture in archaeology at the School of Geography, Archaeology and Irish Studies at NUI Galway and today this video is going to be about Roscommon Castle and we are currently in front of uh, Roscommon Castle. Roscommon Castle is, we, we, we could say, was in its time one of the finest, if not the finest, of castles built by the Anglo-Normans in 13th century Ireland. But again, uh, like all other castles, or many other castles, it was inhabited for a number of centuries. And we can see in the late 16th century, it was a, lo a large po portion of it, particularly the eastern and northern sides of the castle, were substantially rebuilt by a new English uh, administrator, soldier, governor and settler called Sir Nicholas Mulby. Uh, in the early 1580s this happened. But actually, between um, the mid 14th century and about 1569, the castle was actually in the hands of the local Gaelic Irish O'Connor family. So that's a sort of basic, basic background. But I think really the main point is that this is a really fantastic late 13th century castle. A uh, decision to build a castle here was as early as 1262. But it wasn't until 1269 that the Dublin government, under the justiciar Robert Dufford, decided to start to construct a castle here. Well, the first thing is you're going to say, well, why was the castle built? The castle was built to stop the depredations, the raiding and burning uh, being carried out by Eochrahur, Hugh O'Connor, King of Connacht. Hugh, uh, fought tooth and nail to stop Anglo-Norman stroke English encroachment on his land. In fact, Hugh is interesting because he, because of his marriage to uh, the daughter of the Lord of the Isles, he is credited with being the first man who brought gallow glasses to Ireland. You know, basically heavy professional infantry that were a feature of Gaelic uh, armies right throughout uh, the, 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 the Middle Ages. So Hugh was a great soldier, but anyway, the Dublin government decided to build a castle here to stop his activities. But in a way, why here, exactly here? Why couldn't it have been, say, somewhere down the road, say, more into O'Connor territory, like we'll say somewhere in the Tulsk area? But again, like we mentioned the other day at Roscommon Abbey, Roscommon as a settlement uh, was a very important O'Connor centre prior to the construction of this castle. We appear to have had a town here. There was an Augustinian monastery. This is in 1269. An Augustinian monastery, a secular town. It was the centre of road communications. Work by Linda Doran has shown that. Um, it was an important metal working centre. There was a Dominican priory here. So it's an important centre and of course um, it was a good place to build a castle. But why here, this particular spot within Roscommon? For example, where the Catholic Church is today is the highest point. And here we think, well, why is the castle sited here on the northern edge of Roscommon? Well, the first thing we uh, have to remember is that up to about 1800 or so, there was a lake to our west and to our north, to the west and north of the castle. And during research carried out by Margaret Murphy uh, at NUI Goway about 20 years ago, she uncovered the remains of a map which showed the lake, which is now a turlock, only appears in win winter, um, the waters of the lake, um, being used as a, a sort of defensive feature in the uh, defences of the castle. And so what we have here, when we look at the map, we realise that the waters of the lake defended the castle on its northern, western and southwestern side. And furthermore, there was a ditch around the castle, which we'll talk about later, on its eastern, 
and southern sides, which was wet. In other words, the waters of the lake were diverted to fill that ditch. So actually, while uh, the castle is located in low-lying ground, it's actually in a relatively defensive position. But it's a little bit more than that too, because we there are strong hints in the surviving documentation that there was an O'Connor residence at Roscommon prior to 1269. In other words, in the, probably in the 11th, 12th, 13th century. And at times, the O'Connor, King of Connacht, would have lived here. Now, when we actually look at the archaeological evidence around the town, and we look at hints within the documents, we have come to the conclusion that that O'Connor residence was a Cranog that lay about 200 metres out into the lake to the west of where we are now. So in other words, not only were the Anglo-Normans taking over, sorry, using a naturally fortified position, they were also replacing an earlier O'Connor residence, which just lay offshore. Okay, so that's, that's important. That's something to remember too, because when we start to look at Anglo-Norman castles, very grand, very, very fine looking places, etc., etc., we often find that actually what they've done is taken over pre-existing Gaelic Irish habitation sites and then built the castle over them. So there, there's a longer uh, history to the site than just the Anglo-Normans, and that's something that you find time and time again. Symbolically, the ideal castle in medieval chivalric society, if you like, was to be seen and observed and to be close to water. We see this again all over Western Europe at this time. Uh, the famous Beaumaris Castle and Caerphilly Castle in Wales, which both more or less date to the same period as this castle, um, are sited in sort of similar low-lying locations beside water. We've just mentioned Beaumaris uh, Castle, um, and this is the other thing to remember about Roscommon Castle. Roscommon Ca the Lord of Roscommon Castle, was the King of England in his position as Lord of Ireland. That is why the Justiciar, the King's representative in Ireland, was involved in the building of the castle in the years after 1269. So Roscommon Castle, like the famous World Heritage Sites uh, in North Wales, Harlech, Carnarfon, um, Beaumaris and Conway, is actually uh, 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 the ultimate lord of the castle, like those castles, was Edward I as, uh, uh, in his position as Lord of Ireland. So this is a royal castle then. So while many, most other um, Anglo-Norman castles in late 12th, 13th century Ireland had you know, major Anglo-Norman barons as their lord, this castle, like Dublin Castle, like Limerick Castle, um, and like Athlone Castle, uh, the lord of the castle was the King of England as Lord of Ireland, a royal castle. And that's kind of important too, because that means we have relatively good documentary evidence for when it was constructed. A. O'Connor, Hugh O'Connor, A. O'Crohor, Hugh O'Connor, King of Connacht, would not have been particularly happy that there was this encroachment into, if you like, his territory. And as the castle was being built, he attacked it and burned uh, the castle on three, if not four different occasions in the early 1270s. So he was, if you like, he was not happy with what was happening here. And he attacked it, burned it, presumably um, stopping building work. But Hugh dies in 1274. And we note from the documentary sources that in 1277, 1278, there's a huge amount of building work carried out at the castle. So I think really what we can say is that although the castle was uh, started in 1269, very little happened here until the late 1270s. And really what we have a castle, the castle here really dates to the late 1270s and huge amounts of money were spent on it. Type of castle known as a keepless castle. 
uh, that's the first thing. And if we look behind us, we can see the remains of a twin-towered gatehouse. I might add, we'll talk about this later, but the windows are inserts of late 16th century date. This keepless castle had a large D-shaped gatehouse that went into, that extended back into the ward of the, of the uh, castle, very much a late 13th century form. And in that keep gatehouse, if you like, or that gatehouse, we would have had um, residential accommodation for the constable of the castle, the constable being the man who was charged with its defence uh, by the Dublin government, us usually uh, an Anglo-Norman knight from further east, maybe one of the Dillons or people like that, would also probably have had um, maybe a public room like a hall within the, within the uh, gatehouse. Also, garderobes, that's something to remember here. Garderobes are lavatories. And actually, what we will note is that both in the Twin Tower gatehouse behind me and the corner towers, you can see the northeast and the southeast towers behind me to the left and right, uh, the chambers at certainly two levels of these towers had the rooms, in other words, had garderobes. So we're talking about ensuite accommodation, if you like. So the Keepless Castle, the what we call the inner ward, had a tower as well, a three-storey tower at its northeastern side, southeastern side, and southwestern side. As I said, the chambers uh, were lit probably, sorry, possessed these garderobes, little, little lavatories, uh, a fireplace we would think, and were lit by large plunging arrow loops, which we'll see in a minute. Very fine accommodation, uh, both in the Twin Tower Gatehouse and in the uh, Corner Towers. There's a number of blocked up arrow loops and arrow loops that we can still see. And we would suggest to you that the, the crenellations, the notched battlements, if you like, uh, surmounting these towers and also the curtain wall of the castle were replete with arrow loops. So not only do we have a very fine, impressive castle visually located beside the lake, but also um, you know, with fine accommodation, residential accommodation, stuff we wouldn't sneer at today, if you like, uh, but between the fireplaces and the uh, garderobe, it was also well defended. And this makes a huge amount of sense, because as far as I can, this, this is a frontier area between a powerful Gaelic prince and the Anglo-Norman colony, and the documents back that up. It is constantly under attack in the late 13th and 14th century. Yes, this is a visual ex expression of power. Yes, this is a very impressive building. Yes, there is top-rate residential accommodation here, but I would really emphasize that this is a this in the late 13th century was a very well defended building replete with angle towers portcullises in the entranceway passages uh, draw bridges etc one of the things we noticed here when we were working here is that the ditch that i mentioned which you can just about see on the eastern and southern sides. For example, if we look over there, we can see a crack in the wall. This appears to be where the original 13th century ditch was located. And then over here, you can see a dip in the ground surface. This is the remains of the line of the 13th century original ditch but it was filled in by Sir Nicholas Mulby in the late 16th century. But the ditch is there, it's filled in, and there are, we can see uh, evidence for it in the ground surface. It's actually easier to see around the southern side. And on the northern side, the ditch is still there because Mulby in the late 16th century turned that into the northern side of the ditch into a garden feature. 
But remember, the Anglo-Norman colony in Ireland came under fierce pressure from the late 13th century onwards, but particularly in the 14th century, in, a, in um, something known as the Gaelic Resurgence, where Irish lords started to successfully fight back, if you like, against uh, the Anglo-Norman English colony in Ireland, and large parts of the country came under, uh, back under the control of Gaelic Irish uh, lords uh, and princes. And what we have here at Roscommon is that by about 1360 or so, Roscommon Castle is in the hands of the O'Connors. So in other words, the O'Connors move back into Roscommon uh, town and take over control of the castle and are back in control again. From what the O'Connors themselves had their own problems in the late 14th century. They start to they start to uh, fight amongst themselves and they split up into two branches. One is O'Connor Don, the Brown O'Connor, and the other is O'Connor Roe, O'Connor Rua, O'Croher Rua, uh, the Red O'Connor. Presumably, uh, this is to do with the hair colour of the two, um, well, Turlock Roe, Turlock Don, um, O'Connor, who are sort of fighting for control of the O'Connor. Uh, dynasty. But it appears that the O'Connor Don dynasty were here for most of the late 14th and 15th and early to mid 16th century. Around the year 1360 the O'Connors take control of Roscommon Castle and they hold it throughout the, particularly the O'Connor Don branch, throughout the late 14th, uh, 15th and early to mid 16th century. What is interesting is when we look for architectural evidence of O'Connor occupation, we find there is really none. And we've thought through this quite a few times. It's been seen at a number of other castles. For example, at Ballantubber, uh, there's a, 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 to the, to the north-west uh, of here, the castle dates to around 1300. Okay, so we have this O'Connor occupation of Roscommon Castle from about 1360 through to uh, actually 1569 when the O'Connors surrender the castle back to the Dublin government, to the English-controlled Dublin government. Um, but what is interesting, as I say, there isn't much in the way of architectural evidence for what is um, a 200-year occupation by the uh, Gaelic-Irish O'Connors. Now this has been seen at a number of other uh, Anglo-Norman castles taken over by Gaelic-Irish lords during the course of the 14th century in uh, during the Gaelic resurgence. They take over the castles but other than repair them etc etc they don't carry out any major building works. Now there's a little bit of a uh, dilemma here because if people remember the other day when we were talking at Roscommon Abbey, there's a massive building rebuilding phase at Roscommon Abbey, i.e. Roscommon Dominican Priory, in the 15th century. And we see this elsewhere in Ireland as well. There's a huge amount of, you know, small castles like tower houses going up, but also a massive amount of building of friaries and um, you know, friaries and uh, rebuildings of abbeys and things like that. Okay, so it would seem to me that the wealth and know-how to carry out major building works are there in Gaelic Ireland, that's for sure, because we see it elsewhere. But it's just the way Gaelic society was organised. Things like partible inheritance among an extended kin group, lack of primogeniture in um, uh, in, in terms of passing on lordships. In other words, it, it, it could be your nephew or your cousin, your second cousin even, who takes over from you as lord of a territory, you know, within the extended kin group, things like that. Um, and also the Gaelic, uh, Gaelic methods of carrying out uh, warfare using the landscape rather than fixed fortifications. You know, we've come up with a number of reasons why Gaelic lords mightn't want to carry out huge renovations and uh, things like that to, to uh, castles. We have 
um, the fact that it comes back under the control of the Dublin government in 1569, the English controlled Dublin government. And by 1577, the Dublin government have granted Roscommon Castle out to Sir Nicholas Mulby, a new English administrator, soldier, uh, and actually governor of Connacht. Uh, they've granted out the castle of Roscommon and the manor of Roscommon to this man. He's a very brave man, there's no doubt about that, but he was also, uh, how would we call it, a bit of a chancer too. But anyway, he manages to amass 17,000 acres and Roscommon Castle is his main residence. And what does he do here? Well, if we look behind us, we can see that he turned the gatehouse and the northeast and northwest towers. He joins them all up in a huge L-shaped fortified house that was influenced by the Renaissance. Um, so while it is fortified, and there are things like gun loops and things like that, there's also a large amounts of windows at its upper levels, fireplaces. There's also symmetry. If, if we look at the, at the symmetry, the way the windows there are balanced, those inserted transomed and mullioned windows, you can see symmetry in the design of th this rebuild, if you like, of the northern half of the inner ward of the original castle. So Renaissance influenced uh, um, fortified house, Mulby changes, re renovates, rebuilds, whatever you want to call it, turning the northern half of the inner ward into this massive three to four storey fortified house, a, a fitting residence for a man who has been granted 17,000 acres. Um, it actually, with Portumna Castle, uh, it is one of the largest fortified houses, uh, Renaissance influenced fortified houses built in Ireland. But he does more than just build the house. He turns the main entrance uh, of the house, faces it towards the south. There's a tree lined drive we know from early maps. Um, approaching the castle from the town. There may even have been a tree-lined avenue approaching the whole complex uh, from the east. He turns the east side of the castle. He fills in that ditch that we talked about on its eastern and southern sides, the earlier ditch. He leaves the northern uh, line of the ditch, that 13th century ditch, open, full of water. He creates this wall running out eastwards and turning turning right and then running northwards and turns it into a garden and we again we presume a renaissance influence garden symmetry you know um, symmetry in the garden civilization englishness things like this but the thing is it is ireland and there are problems and we note at the southeastern side where the entrance um, from this field into the Malloy's house there was originally a circular uh, flanking tower with gun loops and there's historical evidence that another uh, circular flanking tower we can see just about the foundations of the southeastern tower today we can, there was there does seem to have been a northeastern tower as well nearer the lake. So he create, not only does he create a garden to the east and indeed north of uh, the old inner ward of the 13th century castle, in the late 16th century does this, he has to fortify that garden as well. And the wall itself, if you, particularly uh, if you look behind there, just if you look behind, you have um, a wall that is about five meters in height, I would suggest originally with the circular flanking towers as well. It was quite a formidable, formidable sorry, um, uh, uh, wall, with, as I say, with, 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 with towers that had gun loops. And in a way, Mulby's right to keep the defences of the castle going, because during the Nine Years' War, the castle is attacked by Red Hugh O'Donnell in 1596 and again in 1599. 
I think in the 1596 siege, um, quite a number of the garrison, the new English garrison, die. And what's interesting again about that is that 15 of them are sort of, you know, are killed or died of wounds, but the substantial rest uh, die of disease, which often happens in medieval sieges. People don't actually die, uh, or, or, or post-medieval sieges, people don't really die necessarily of gunshot wounds or, or killed outright. They actually often die of disease. Um, and, 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 and there's quite a lot of information on that siege by the uh, Northern, you know, O'Donnells and the Northern Alliance during the uh, Nine Years' War. We also hear of, you know, massive damage to the castle during this, uh, this time. So that's in, in, interesting. Uh, after the Nine Years' War, I think uh, Malby's, I think it's probably his daughter-in-law actually, or perhaps his widow, I'm not quite sure, um, it, it's uncertain. Uh, applies for compensation, but during the 1640s, the castle is attacked again during the wars of the 1640s, and it's surrendered uh, by, I think, Colonel Charles O'Connor in 1652 uh, to the Cromwellian general, I think uh, uh, to a Cromwellian general on terms. And then at the beginning of the Williamite Wars, Patrick Sarsfield orders its demolition, the castle's demolition. And this seems to have been done because all the antiquarian uh, drawings of the 18th century show it to be in a ruin, much, much like it is today. So we would seem, it would seem to me that the castle had an active life until uh, the later 17th century when it was slighted, demolished uh, to prevent it becoming um, to, to, you know, to prevent it being used by the enemy, if you like, during the Williamite War. Four angled towers have what we would call, they have evidence for a particular type of arrow loop known as a plunging loop. And there is a plunging loop. Uh, we're now looking at the uh, southeastern tower of the inner ward. A plunging loop is an arrow loop that you can not only fire out of, which is normal for an arrow loop, but actually they're so long um, and that you can fire downwards, that you can actually fire directly outwards, but you can actually put an arrow or a bolt at the base of the, the wall. And it's also interesting, when you go into the embrasures of those arrow loops, they have uh, little recesses, like little cupboards on either side, and I wonder if that wasn't to give elbow room uh, to the archers, but particularly the crossbowmen who would have been um, stationed, if you like, uh, during an attack uh, at, at the, you know, in these positions. And we look at this feature here, this squinch arch, this is the shoot C-H-U-T-E of a garderobe. In other words, the uh, issue from the lavatories above, the garderobe above, would have uh, issued out here. So that window there, while it's an in, it, it, well, it tells us two things. That window um, is where the actual uh, garderobe would have been, but it shows you that even in the late 16th century, they were still using the late 13th century lavatories. Okay, so very fine accommodation within that twin tower gatehouse. The other thing that you can see here is we can just about see some of the render, original render of the castle. And that's something to remember too. Remember uh, castles the walls would have been plastered, the walls of the rooms would have been plastered internally, probably tapestries, even wall paintings. Um, you know, very fine wooden furniture, you know, things like that. The interiors would have been plastered and whitewashed, as I say, maybe wall paintings and tapestries hanging, hanging on the wall. But the external um, walls would have been rendered as well to make them waterproof. This idea of sort of open stonework, uh, you know, did not occur, okay? So you can just about make out the original render. Some of it is still surviving.
There is a mullioned window. It's an insert. It's inserted into the 13th century Twin Tower Gatehouse by uh, Sir Nicholas Mulby in the late 16th century. So it's part of that fortified house. Now it actually is a ground floor window, and but it's not at ground level. It's way up high, uh, but it lights the ground floor. And the reason why it's not at ground level is, of course, that this is a fortified house. That is a defensive feature. It gives light to the ground floor room, but it's way up high in the wall. It's not actually at ground level. Um, and then above it, you can see a first floor window, what we would call um, a transomed and mullioned window, two lights in width, two lights in height. Um, again, inserted by Sir Nicholas uh, Mulby. But originally, you can see the bar holes for uh, the, the windows. It they would have had glass originally. In all, it would have been uh, you know, they're very fine looking and well preserved windows. We're actually looking at the northern side of the northern tower of the Twin Tower Gatehouse. And you can see the remains of a blocked up 13th century plunging loop, effectively at first floor level. You see that there? Uh, you can see the inserted the inserted uh, windows of late 16th century date, the transomed and mullioned windows, again showing symmetry. And then down below, you can see the remains of a cross loop that we can see from the diagonal tooling on the, on the um, uh, dress stone that it was originally 13th century in date. Now, it, from what we can see, it's partly blocked up, but they've also played around with the cross loops a little bit, widened them, presumably to turn them into gun loops. And we see that in other places uh, as well, where earlier loops, if they're not block blocked up, they're sometimes um, uh, they're sometimes widened, so it makes it easier for people to uh, fire uh, handguns out of something like that. Okay, but we can see chronological depth very clearly. Arrow loops blocked up, partly blocked up, of 13th, late 13th century date. We can see the render very clearly here as well that would have covered the castle, uh, the outer walls of the castle, and we can see inserted windows of late 16th century date. The other thing that's really interesting too, if we look at the middle window in particular, which would be, I would be a, a first floor window, um, we can see that there's, there seems to be sandstone, dressed sandstone jams to that window, but actually it isn't. Because when, when we get up there and look at it, um, it's actually plaster work pretending to be expensive imported sandstone blocks. So it, 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 it's not quite as grand as it looks. So you can see these pretend sandstone blocks on the left hand side of that window. Uh, we see this in other uh, surrounds around these late 16th century windows. So it's basically Mulby pretending that he's imported sandstone blocks, possibly from uh, Western England somewhere, and that he had the money to do this. But actually, it's just pretend plaster work. Here is a fireplace inserted into the Twin Tower gatehouse, dating, uh, you know, this insertion again is done by Mulby into the 13th century gate tower in the late 16th century. Now, th again, the insertion of fireplaces uh, into these older buildings is a feature of Mulby's work. Um, again, Renaissance influenced this uh, emphasis on light, more windows, and also on comfort, i.e. more heat, means that loads of fireplaces were inserted into this fortified house, created out of the Twin Tower Gatehouse, the Northeast Tower, and the Northwest Tower, this L-shaped uh, gatehouse. But what's interesting about 
this fireplace is that it tells us something and that is we can see that the dressed the surviving dressed stone is punch dressed um, in my opinion a, a lake type of punch dressing punch dressing is very much associated with the 15th 16th century uh, in in Ireland and it seems to me that this is an indication that Malby, although he's part of the new English Elizabethan administration, is actually using local Irish workmen in his building and rebuilding, if you like, his building of his massive fortified house. So that's kind of interesting. So punch dressed stone, late 16th century, inserted fireplace into the gatehouse and he's using local Irish workmen who, who to a certain extent probably you'll find that men of lower status at this stage don't really care who's employing them whether it's Gaelic lords or new English lords or old English lords as long as the old money is coming in I think that as long as they're paid they're quite happy to work for anybody so we're going into the northwest tower of the inner ward and that is late 13th century in date like all the other towers but you can see that Mulby in the late 16th century inserts these transomed and mullioned large windows and also fireplaces all Rena renaissance influenced okay you see the inserted fireplaces and up above there as well you know, light and heat, comfort. I'm now at descending into what remains, at least to the naked eye, above ground, what remains of the late 13th century castle ditch. That uh, ditch that was built on the outer edge of the castle in the late 16th century. Sorry, say again, in the late 13th century. In the late 16th century, Malby fills in the ditch on its eastern and southern sides, but he keeps this stretch of the ditch open and turns it into a pond for his, as a sort of garden feature. And ponds were a feature of these Renaissance influenced uh, gardens that we see in the late 16th and 17th century in Ireland and in Britain and other places. So I'm now going down into the ditch. I now fall into the ditch. Here we are. This is the ditch. You can see the, the green. It actually fills up in winter again, but it's about eight meters in width and about two meters in depth beneath ground level. So it's a fine feature. So we have to imagine this ditch all the way around the castle. But again, it's reused, as I said, in the late 16th century as a pond. Originally not blocked from the lake, filled in from the waters of the lake. Um, and then, as I say, used again as a pond. And if we go up where I am now is literally the outer northern edge of the outer ward of the 13th century castle. Again, we don't see stone buildings in this part of the castle. We're about 20 meters out from the wall and towers of the inner ward, maybe even a bit more. Certainly on the western side, it's probably about 30 meters. So we would presume there were timber buildings here and either a stone wall which is now gone, again probably destroyed in the late 16th century, or a palisade here, and timber buildings within the interior originally. Again, it all becomes a garden in the late 16th century. At the northwestern tower of the 13th century castle, the late 13th century royal castle, we can see but in the late 16th century, transomed and mullioned windows were inserted into this tower. <coughs> we can also see the remains of a dumbbell shaped gun loop up there, reminding us that these places are fortified. 
But one thing that we did notice, Margaret Murphy, who, who did a lot of the study here, noticed back about 18 years ago, was that all the features of the upper floor of this tower appear to be late, late 16th century. So eventually we came to the conclusion, or she came to the conclusion, that there were three floors to the uh, other towers, the northeast, southeast, and southwest towers, but this northwest tower, the one away from the main approaches to the castle, protected by the lake and the ditches on, two, on, on, on all its sides, actually only had two floors, actually only had two floors, and that the third floor was actually built in the late 16th century by Mulvey. In other words, there were originally two floors to this tower as built in the late 16th century, and the upper floor was built in the late 16th century. You can see blocked up arrow loops every three meters or so with holes underneath them. Those, what we seem to be looking at is actually the crenellations the battlements of the 13th century tower. And it shows us to, that the notched battlements, the merlons as we call them, had arrow loops within them. And there may also have been evidence for a timber hoard uh, there as well. Or alternatively, those holes that you can see just there were drain holes to drain away water. But probably the main thing that comes out of a really in-depth analysis of this tower is that the battlements of the, of the towers originally had merlons and crenellations that were replete with arrow loops as well. And we worked it out that each tower had somewhere between 12 and 14 arrow loops between the plunging loops at first and second floor level in the other three towers and then also the arrow loops at battlement level. And we also know too from evidence in other little parts of the castle that the curtain walls, that the crenellations of the curtain wall of the inner ward at least, had also arrow loops in their merlons. So overall, this is the whole point about this castle, that when we look at it, when we look at things like the gatehouse, references to portcullises, evidence for murder holes and drawbridge pits, when we look at the amount of blocked up arrow loops that we can see, when we use evidence from, say, for example, this northwest tower, and think of what originally existed on the other towers, evidence for concentric defence, evidence for a wet ditch, we have a very seriously defended castle and it really does compare well to other royal castles in North Wales. That doesn't take away from the impressive nature, um, its wonderful sighting beside a lake, the wonderful residential accommodation within it, but it's a top-rate castle for the late 13th century uh, in defensive terms as well. And to me that makes all the sense in the world because it is constantly under attack. We know this from references within the colonial sources and also within the native Gaelic Irish annals. We're looking at the northern wall of the inner ward of the castle. So the northeast tower, the northwest tower, would have been joined by a curtain wall with Merlon's crenellations originally. Okay. But the main point here is that in the late 16th century, those windows are inserted. It would seem to me, and I've said also that the third floor of the Northwest Tower is added on. The curtain wall is heightened and incorporated into this L-shaped fortified house. So what you've got to imagine is that the whole space, it's all destroyed now, it's all gone, but that whole space was um, filled up with these windows and this huge fortified house. So you're actually running from the gatehouse up to the northeast tower and then across to the northwest tower, 
uh, this sort of three to four story high fortified house, so the largest fortified houses in Ireland. And yet not an awful lot is known about it, um, but, but top, top rate. But just imagine w th this all the space here, all filled in between this northeast tower and this northwest west tower with windows, transoms and mullioned windows at ground level, high in the wall of the ground level, then a first floor level with transoms and mullioned windows, two lights in height, two lights in width, you can see them there, and then a third floor, and then possibly even an attic floor uh, beyond. It must have been huge, and it, as I said, it was the centre of a 17,000 acre um, New English estate based here at Roscommon in the late 16th century. And it saw all that action during the Nine Years' War as well. So, amazing place. What can we say just to finish off? Well, first of all, we can say that there is a top-rate, late 13th century royal castle here at Roscommon, built, really built, in the late 1270s, although started in 1269. The raison d'etre for the castle is to basically keep Hugh O'Connor and the O'Connors under control, something that ultimately doesn't work. And by 1360, the O'Connors, the descendants of Hugh O'Connor, if you like, have taken over the castle. And we have the O'Connors living here for 200 years. There is little in the way in terms of architectural remains uh, for that long period of Gaelic Irish occupation. And this is something that we see at a number of Anglo-Norman castles. For example, Ballantubber around here, Green Castle in Donegal. The Irish take it over, but they, they, they repair it, they use it, but they don't seem to carry out um, any massive under, building undertakings themselves. Now that, to me, when we look at the overall evidence, is not because they're not able to do that, or they don't have the wealth and know-how. They do, but it's just the way Gaelic society is organised. You know, things like, uh, you know, partable inheritance, things like that, goes against uh, the, uh, the, the, the Irish putting big money into large secular buildings. With the gradual English reconquest of Ireland, Roscommon Castle, the O'Connors are, are more or less told to leave Roscommon Castle in 1569. They surrender it to Sir Henry Sidney. And then in the late 1570s, Roscommon is granted to Sir Nicholas Malby, a you know, cavalry commander, administrator, new English conquistadore, interesting man, t ruthless man, and, it, and also he becomes Governor of Connacht and he turns the northern half of the inner ward into a really massive fortified house. He also creates a garden to the north and east of the castle. B because of uh, circumstances of conquest and upheaval, that garden is fortified, but we can imagine that that garden reflected the symmetry of the house. Order, civilization, a statement of loyalty to the crown, etc. A number of people have worked here. Harold Leask, uh, Margaret Murphy, Dan Titch Tyler, Paul Nasons, myself, numerous others. What type of approach do we take? Well, we take what we call a kind of multidisciplinary approach, which is we look in, at uh, the architectural remains, try and work out phases. We look at the historical sources, a little bit of excavation, archaeological excavation, geophysical survey, looking at early maps. You know, th this, th this is a, what we call a kind of interdisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary uh, approach. And by doing that, we come up with an idea how the castle functioned and how it developed over time. I hope we've shown you that over the last hour or so.